Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lisa Apolinsky, content coach and America's digital content futurist. And I am so excited for my guest, who is a local Zoni like me. Um, we actually used to live just a few miles from each other, and then I moved. Uh, Susan Baer, she is um, an expert in market research and helping you establish and grow your ROI and reputation based on evidence-based decision-making. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> Susan, if you want to uh, give a quick introduction of who you are, what you do, and who you work with. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. It's nice to be here. Uh, yeah, my agency is called Audience Audit. We're a thought leadership agency, and we're helping clients build their thought leadership on uh, unique custom quantitative research. So our clients are uh, agency owners, marketing agency owners, uh, speakers, professional authors, folks who are working to build their reputation and the visibility to benefit their business. Uh, and that's that's who we work with. That's awesome. So I understand what it means to be a thought leader, as do you. Mm -hmm. um, but I want you to explain a little bit of why that's important and how you can leverage the market research that you do in your agency to actually establish that authority power. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because we've done a lot of research into thought leadership and with thought leadership followers. And one of the interesting things is that thought leadership doesn't have a stellar reputation. You know, um, we did a study with our mutual friends at Predictive ROI um, with B2B thought leadership followers. And 73% of them, even though they do follow thought leaders, experts in their industry, think that most thought leadership is just bunk, is just sort of ego and pitching. And we've all had those conference experiences where you're really excited about a workshop or a, or a talk and you go in and you realize you're just being subjected to a 40 minute pitch uh, from, oh. from the stage. Yes. Um, yes. So it, it's, you know, it's a term that I think that the people that we hope to reach have started to view with a little bit of skepticism. Um, and it's funny because the bar they set for someone that they will follow and learn from is not very high. <laughs> they, they want someone who's who's providing something new. So that can be new information, a new perspective, new insights, a new synthesis of stuff. It just gives it's it's not thought regurgitation that they're hearing from everybody else. It's something new. Um, they want it surprisingly, shockingly, to be helpful. Um, in their business, uh, both from a strategic and a tactical standpoint is what we found in the research. And they want it from someone um, that they like and trust. And, and this really boils down to uh, certainly authenticity, vulnerability, somebody who feels human and not preachy, somebody they're not afraid to approach, someone who they feel like they could have a conversation with. Fundamentally, somebody they feel like they could work with, you know, that they would actually like and enjoy. And I think the trust factor is so big. I know you are familiar with the Edelman Trust Barometer and, and their research every year on trust. And the news is not good. You know, our society is uh, losing trust in everything um, at levels that have not been seen in decades. So the the opportunity to actually build a relationship based on trust based on being helpful with new information is it's not that hard to do but it takes intention and it takes consistency and and it can takes it, it takes work and investment in in of time and resources and all sorts of things so um is, is it there to be available it is you just have to work at it. And the and the research demonstrates that the benefits are extraordinary. People who follow someone who has a reputation as an expert, as a thought leader, um, are much more likely to pay attention to that person's content, 
They are much more likely to share that content with other people they think will benefit. They are much more likely to consider hiring that person and then to hire that person. They are much less likely to leave that person from for a working relationship and go to somebody else. Um, they are much more likely to pay higher rates uh, for someone that has that kind of a reputation. So the benefit is tremendous for businesses. But I think that a lot of us are just sort of throwing stuff out there on social every once in a while talking about ourselves. And that's that's not that's not what real thought leadership is in in the eyes of the people who are looking for it from us. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you talked about um consistency. Yeah. I, I I'm sure you get this question a lot because I get a lot. Yeah. Well, how much should I be writing? How much should I be posting? And yeah. I, I, I would love to hear your your answer on that based on market research. Yeah. So what matters is consistency. It's it's not as much. And I think it depends on your audience and the kind of thing you do. I mean, we both know people who have systems in place and they're posting eight or 10 times a day on a platform like LinkedIn. Um, and they're testing it. They're looking at frequency and that's what is working for them. Um, I am doing, um, in my best quarter, I am doing a video every week on my Fun With Research YouTube channel. I'm doing um, posts uh, every month on my blog and I'm sharing um, aspects of that conversation every week uh, on LinkedIn and Facebook. And um, that seems to be working. Uh, I think without the without the A B testing and saying, all right, now well, now let's try it six times a week instead of one time a week, you sort of don't know. But I can tell you that um, I've been able to develop a, a a reputation as an expert and a thought leader in my niche with the people that I care about with a combination of that sort of content stuff, and then you know coming on webinars or podcasts that other people are doing or speaking at events every once in a while. Um, so I think everybody sort of has to figure out their own formula. I, I actually, in, in my experience with our clients, most of us should not be worrying about how often. Most of us should be worrying about doing it at all yes. <laughs> and doing it consistently. So I would much rather somebody say, all right, I'm going to do one post a month and I'm going to do one post a week on social based on that monthly post and look for opportunities to speak to my audience through other platforms like podcasts or webinars or stuff like that, that people can help me with. That's a great start. Um, most of us, the problem isn't, can we do it more? Most, in my experience, the problem is, can we do it at all? And can we, can we stay consistent with it? Because again, you're building trust. So if you're gonna if you're gonna share something helpful, help them to know when to expect it. Help them to look for it. You know, if you're doing research and you're doing it every year, they will come to say, when is your next research is coming out? Drew McClellan and I at AMI have a um, a research study, the Agency Edge that we've been doing. This is our eleventh year of doing annual research, and every year we have people saying, what's the new research going to be about? When is it coming out? When you know because they've found it helpful and they're looking to expect it. And, and if you can build that and then live up to it, that's great. If you're kind of all over the place, it's really hard for them to stick with you because they just sort of, you know, they don't know when you're going to show up. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple of questions and I'm, and I'm going to leave with this one first and then we go to my second one. Um, so when you're working with agency owners mm -hmm. with their thought leadership, mm -hmm. what is the biggest obstacle you see them facing leveraging the market research into their thought leadership or their authority power strategy? That's a good question. So actually there are a few um, that really get in the way. One is the whole, I don't know that we're special enough to have a reputation like this. You know, there's that sort of imposter syndrome and, you know, there's thousands of digital marketing agencies. Why do we have anything that anybody's gonna pay attention to? 
And, and we do regularly have prospects who come in and I'll say, so let's talk about your point of view as an agency and sort of go, oh, I don't know what, I don't know that we have one. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure. And inevitably, as we sort of ask them questions and start sort of peeling the onion, it's very clear that they do have a point of view. They just haven't thought of it in that context. And so they need some help sort of visualizing that. And then that sort of develops their belief that they do actually have something that's unique to say. Because yes, there are 10,000 digital agencies in your neighborhood, but they're not all doing the same thing and they don't all believe in doing the same thing the same way. So you do have something unique to say. So getting over that initial hurdle of, are we worth it? Are we special enough? Um, is hard, I think, for a lot of agencies. Um, visibility is hard um, for folks. And, you know, there's no point in having a lot of great thought leadership if you're not, if people aren't seeing it, the people that you want to see it. Right. Um, and so, you know, we're working with clients to help them think about others who are serving those communities that might be great participants in thought leadership with them, partners in doing research or willing to let you share what you have found with their community and, and really sort of just building relationships. Uh, this is Pam Slim's widest net approach. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's really powerful and could really help tremendously with visibility as does the whole, let's be consistent. Let's talk about something for a quarter. You know, let's talk about the various aspects of it every month and week within that quarter. And then let's, next quarter, let's talk about something else that's central to our point of view. Um, so that sort of consistency. And then I think the third thing that, that people forget to do is to develop a strategy for converting your followers into an addressable audience. So, you know, all of us who are doing any kind of thought leadership have had the experience of somebody reaching out and saying, hey, I've been following you for two years. And we're finally, you know, we're finally at a place where I think we could talk about maybe working with you. And you didn't even know they were out there. You know, they're just sort of following you. And if you really want to help these people, the best thing you can do is, is get an email address for them and use it to help them more directly. Use it to get them on their on your email newsletter, which has a lot of very concrete, helpful stuff. It's not to turn around and all of a sudden become someone they don't recognize and say, "Hey, I'm glad I got your email. Here's the sign up for my eight week course." You know, that's yeah. that violates trust, right? Yes. But yes. but you but building relationships is important. Business relationships are built on trust. So. If you have something that's valuable enough for them to download a big resource or something like that, um, and they've seen through your free stuff that doesn't that isn't gated, that you really know what you're talking about and have stuff that's relevant to them, then it's a reasonable trade. You know, uh, predictive ROI calls it the screaming cool value exchange, and it is an exchange of value. You're giving them something so helpful that they're willing to give you something, which is their email address. And as long as you honor that exchange in the way that it was intended, then you can really start to build your list and start to do more things to nurture folks over time and, and, and move them to the point where they're ready to have a sales conversation with you. Um, so there are a lot of places where we can all fall down on this, um, but it you do need to do it strategically and I think sometimes people think it's an afterthought. I mean, we 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 know from our own research with agencies that there's a lot of them that just don't do this because they just don't think it's essential. But what we see is that people who do it consistently don't have to do outbound sales yeah. because they have people coming to them who are right fit clients. They don't have to do ad campaigns to try to get clients because they their content their helpful content is getting clients so that you're really sort of shifting what you're working on to grow the business from those kinds of activities and expenses to your time and energy and expertise and investing in something like research or having somebody um, analyze data you've already got in-house because you have an assessment or those kinds of things. You're just shifting your activity and it can be really powerful. But it's all about trust building. That's fundamentally that's what thought leadership is.
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, ha I have to chime in with this because I'm actually having a conversation with um, a potential client and agencies or business owners that get it, mm -hmm. I feel do so much better long-term. Mm -hmm. They have protected themselves in essence against a lot of the economic turmoil. They have, yep. I don't want to say safeguards in place, but they have buffers they're more it's resilient. Like, they're much you more know, resilient. Yeah. We, we did a study in 2022 called the agency audit where we, where we surveyed agency owners about all of this. And there's a range of sort of mindsets around um, where they are with their agencies and the kinds of challenges and struggles and goals that they have. And, and the folks who are doing really, really well um, are using thought leadership to develop a pipeline of right fit clients um, and get a better team that is more loyal and doesn't leave and, and are getting paid what they're worth to do the work that they do because they're recognized as experts. Mm -hmm. And the other group is also doing a lot of that thought leadership stuff. And they're really, they're really focusing on client loyalty and keeping their clients engaged, informed, and happy. And, and those folks are doing tons better than everybody else in the study who's struggling with staffing issues or sales issues or profitability issues or you know you name it and it it's just very clear that there is um a correlation but between folks who are doing and intentionally investing in strong thought leadership efforts and client loyalty efforts which by the way is one of the other things that thought, a thought leadership reputation helps with. Clients are less likely to leave you because you're the recognized expert. Um, so all of these things sort of blend together, but the folks who are doing that, we see dramatically fewer challenges, dramatically more resistance to economic issues. Last year was terrible for agencies. Um, and if you had a thought leadership reputation that was bringing clients into you during that turmoil, that helped. Good for you, you know. Um, so we see it in we see it in the data too, um, yeah. and it, it's just it's just too bad that so many of us, you know, I call them the cobbler's kids because there are so many of us who know this should be done. We're teaching our clients to do it, and and we are failing to do it for our own agencies. So absolutely, yeah. And um, you know, I think it's it's really important to point out this is like you said, trust is a long game. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know, you're not going to have an overnight TikTok success. Sorry. You're mm -hmm. not going to have an overnight success story with a book. Sorry. And you're not going to have an overnight success with posting a couple pieces of content or doing mm -hmm. a very short term strategy and think that suddenly you're going to get a flock of people that show up. Yep. Um, trust takes time to build. Yep. Yep. And, and it, you don't you build have, it by talking about yourself. Yes. You build it by being helpful. You know, um, yes. I, I don't, I, nobody wants to see your content about how amazing you are and how you've won all these awards and, and how you, you know, this is your process for this and that. And you've got this new thing that you're trying to sell. That's not helpful content for the audience. Um, you, you really have to put yourself in their shoes and think about what you know, who you know, what mm -hmm. you can teach, what you can share that is going to make a marked improvement in their situation. If they learn it, if they implement it, if they try it for themselves. Yeah. And that's, yeah. you know, the great thought leaders, the ones that really are building that trust, that's what they're doing. You know, they're being helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. in that vein of being relentlessly helpful, which I love, I, and that's from predictive, being relentlessly helpful. I know there is pushback, at least from some uh, agency owners, some business owners that they don't want to give away everything because then no one will pay for their services. Right. What does the research show us as to providing stuff that is relentlessly helpful and free and attracting those right fit clients? So... You know, what happens, we talk about the funnel. We talk about what how, how people get engaged during the funnel. And one of the things we know is that there's there's a, a long time in agency world 
that someone can be following you, paying attention to you before you even know they're out there. And they're using what they see from you and about you to sort of decide whether to stick around and keep going. And then you get to this phase where, okay, they haven't hired you yet, but they've actually let you know who they are because they've downloaded something or attended a webinar or something like that. And now we're on your email list and are getting your emails and sort of looking at things or whatever. And, and then it gets to the point where they say, okay, now we're ready. Like we know we're, we, we have built sufficient trust. It's the right time for us. Now we're gonna actually reach out and have a sales conversation. And you need to have different things at each of those levels to make the funnel work the way it should. You know, if, if somebody is starting to follow you and instantly sees that all you're doing is selling, they're out. They never get further down the funnel. So you have to have things that you are willing to give away. And, and believe me, I don't want anybody out there giving away their work for free. They're that's supporting themselves, their team, those families that are behind those folks. It's allowing you to continue to do the work you do for clients, right? So I don't want anybody giving away the farm. But you can't expect people to trust you and give you $30,000 or whatever it is if they've seen no evidence that you actually know what you're talking about. Right. If they see nothing come from you that is generous and helpful. So you have to find things that you can teach, um, share, um, that, that are free for people to access without any email or anything. So this is where posts about the research that you've done, where you can do you know, posts that say, hey, our research found this and it's really fascinating and we're incorporating that learning in this way into our work and we think agencies should do this for free. Great, thank you, that was really helpful. Appreciate that, right? So you have a set of things that you'll give away for nothing. And some of those things can be, hey, you know, we do this thing and people always ask us how to do it. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna tell you exactly how to do it. This is the protocol we use for having AI write a blog post for us or whatever, right? So some of those things people may go, whoa, she's giving away for free. That's what they pay to do. It's going to be okay. Trust me. Because again, that builds trust. And then when you get the addressable audience, you can be a little more generous. So for example, you can invite them to a private Q&A where you're doing some teaching like predictive does. It's not public, it's not available for anybody, but it doesn't cost you anything. They're gonna let you in for free, right? And okay. then as you move further down the funnel, you've got things to sell them. So I think, but but you're not talking about that things I can sell you thing until that point. What you're doing before then is just building trust and being helpful. So yeah. I think any of us can sort of go through and go, all right, what do we get asked about what could we help people understand better? What could we teach that would let them have a shot at trying to do better on their own? And, you know, eight times out of 10, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to be able to do it on your own and thank you forever and refer you for having taught them something, right? Or they're going to try it and say, yeah, this is not something we can do on our own, even though we have the directions, we're going to hire you to do it. Yeah. And you yeah. know, it's funny. So um, my next book that's coming out, hopefully in the next few weeks, the greatest personal brand story ever told. Mm -hmm. One of the things I talk about is community and, and tapping brand ambassadors or mm -hmm. disciples. Mm -hmm. um, I always talk about predictive ROI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've never spent a dime with them. Right. And yet, I go out and I tell people, oh, you need to hire them. Yep. I'm, go I'm you know, I, we're talking about this. I'm like, I have to do one of these intensive. I have to, I have to get it yep. on my calendar and do it. And I've, and I've done the, the, you know, invite only workshops and the Q and A's and I always get something out of it. And so I'm always talking about that. Yeah. And I'm not yet a client. Right. Right. I know it's really, it's really powerful. And, and we've had some clients over the years who did sort of their thought leadership research and did a big report and all this kind of stuff and then decided that they were only going to give that 
uh, access to people who agreed to have a sales meeting with them. And first of all, that feels super icky, bait and switchy. Yeah. Um, and it, it just doesn't work because it also keeps everyone else's eyes off of that amazing work that you did and that insight that you have and the knowledge that you've invested in understanding something that's important to your prospects because they can't see it. Yeah. They're not, it's invisible to them. Uh, and what happens when they decide to change that is remarkable. And all of a sudden people are saying, oh, they're an expert in this. Or they're an expert in that. I need to be following yeah. their content, listening to what they have to say. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. So I have two, my, my last two books, well, a couple of my books here. In my Persuade with a Digital Content Story, I outlay a six-step formula for writing persuasive content. Mm -hmm. I give you the formula. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this is $10 in paperback. I think it, right. it, it might be like $6 for Kindle. Mm -hmm. I'm not making a, I, I'm not becoming rich off of this book and I right. give you the formula. Yep. Do you yeah. think I still get people who hire me to help them do the content? Absolutely. Yeah. Because right. yep. I, I, and I don't want to bash agency owners, but they're so busy for them to sit down and go through it and practice it, they want that guide. They want that that shepherd to get them through it. My last book with Mark Schaefer, the most amazing marketing book ever. There are yeah. 350 ideas in here. Yeah, great book. From 36 people. Yes. Yep. Yep. We all I mean, my God, here you go. Yep. <laughs> and it's just so... It's just so helpful. It's yeah, just, so, and, you know, and, and, and that's, and that's again, build trust. Yeah. Will come. And do you think Mark Schaefer is now like, oh no, my pipeline's dried up because I put all my ideas into this book. No, no. Right. Exactly. No, no yeah. not at all. Not at yeah. all. Yep. Um, yeah. It's just, and there's this resistance to it, but like you said, the research shows. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to go through gut and intuition marketing talk to susan hire susan and her team so that you actually understand what works and what doesn't and use evidence-based decision making to leverage the right content at the right time and the right thought leadership niche yeah and, and you know there's no reason to guess right this day and age there's absolutely there's no excuse for going I'm just gonna Put it out there and hope to God it works out. Yeah, it's true. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of opinions that are expressed in thought leadership as there should be. I mean, people don't follow us. People follow us for teaching, for guidance. They want to learn from what we have learned. So having your opinion is an essential element of thought leadership. But having some data that you can talk about and then share your opinion and share your advice is powerful, you know, because we can make up all sorts of stuff. Again, trust right. that it's hard to know what's real these days. Um, and, and having some research, you know, it, it can set you apart. It can set you apart with conference organizers who really like research-based organizations because they get a lot of pitches for just talking heads, you know, yes. um, but it also, it also can teach you things. You know, I tell my clients all the time that research is like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. You know what you're going to ask, but you don't know what the answer is going to be. And I think one of the most powerful moments in authentic thought leadership is when a thought leader says, you know, I did this and this surprised the hell out of me. This is not what I expected. And I've sort of rejiggered my perspective mm -hmm. based on this. And I've, yep. I've stopped advising clients to do that. And now I'm advising them to do this because I learned something, you know, and that's, that's great. We all have a lot to learn. None of us are as smart as we think we are. Yes. So back in the day, when mm -hmm. I first started out 30 plus years ago, we would do market research every couple of years because things didn't change that much. Mm. How Now, some people might think, oh, I did the market research, I'm done. And it's it's not a task to check off. It is a habit to get into. 
<laughs> and I cannot stress that enough. Market research has to be done over and over because things change. Yeah. How often are you advising your clients to do market research so that they stay up to date with everything that's changing? Um, I think I think it's great if you can do a study once a year. Um, I don't think it needs to be more often than that. And if you can't do it once a year and could do it every couple of years, that's that's okay too. What you what you really want to make sure, and and you know, you can choose. Um, some studies are sort of covering a topic in and of themselves that's a standalone thing. So Drew and I in the agency edge are typically talking to agency clients. We've had a couple of years where we surveyed agency employees because we're responding to the challenges that agency owners are talking about and want more information on. So every one of our studies is a little different, um, but they're all under this same sort of umbrella of helping agency owners. There's also longitudinal studies where you can study something year after year or quarter after quarter, and you're studying the exact same thing and watching for shifts in how mm -hmm. that changes over time. Um, and, they're, and they're both valid. So it, it sort of depends on what your goal is, what you're tracking in the research, what is going to be most helpful to your audience that you've decided you want to prepare for. So Jay Bayer, who, you know, we all know is one of the greatest marketing teachers I've ever had for sure. And a, you know, very well-known speaker. He does research um, every couple of years for every new book. He's doing completely new research about a new thing because he, because the, the marketplace is changing and he wants to be helpful at every moment. Uh, during that thing. So he's exploring speed and employee experience and user experience and all of these sort of different things. Um, so it just kind of depends on your strategy. But if you can get a research study once a year that you've got under sort of an umbrella of this is the work we do and this is how we share what we know and this is the sequence that we do that in, that's great. Yeah, awesome. it's, I mean, if, if it's one and done, you can milk it for a while, but you, you should follow it up with something. Even if it's a couple of years later, you know, mm -hmm. you should you should do something again yep, yep, to keep yourself fresh. So let's talk budget considerations, because mm -hmm. I know some people, especially agency owners, were coming out of, yep. let's just call it a, a challenging year. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and and. Things are starting to open up, but yep. I'm sure some agency owners are like, well, I'd like to do market research, but I want to make sure I'm spending my budget dollars appropriately yeah, and absolutely. getting the most bang out of my market research buck. Right, for sure. Um, so if you're just getting started and you don't have much or anything in a budget, you should look around at and see if there's data you've already got. So I had a gal reach out to me after a webinar uh, a month or so ago, and she said, she's a coach, and she's had an assessment up on her website since, I don't know, 2019. And she's got over 2,500 responses to this assessment. And I'm like, you've got a gold mine. You're sitting on a gold mine because she's asking people about their values and stuff, which is part of her sort of coaching practice, values-based. And she's got a ton of data that people have provided about their values and how much that certain values drive them and all this kind of stuff. And all we did for her was just help her sort of see what she's got and she's off and running. And, and, and this was just, she'd just been sitting on this for a long time. So you may have an assessment or something like that that's got input from people that you can use that you've already got. Um, you may be able to very inexpensively start building a body of research. So let's mm -hmm. say you've got a community that follows you that's all interested in SEO. That's what you teach. That's what you that's what your agency focuses on, for example. Um, you can ask those folks to take a survey for you. You just build a short survey and you have that whole group take a survey for you. And all of a sudden, You've got data and there are platforms that are very inexpensive for you to do this. 
And then all of a sudden you've got feedback that you can talk about and say, you know, my, my teaching around thought leadership content is that it needs to be one part what the data said, one part what you think about that based on your experience and your expertise, and one part what you advise your audience to do based on that. So if you can get just one part of a data point or something that you found interesting that you can talk about with respect to your point of view and your experience and provide some advice on, you've got thought leadership content. So if you have a community, set up a survey for yourself. Um, if you if you're if you want to serve your B two B audience and their customers are consumers, you can add a few questions to what are called omnibus surveys that are running with the general public all the time in your city, in your state, in your region, across the country. It's very inexpensive to add a few questions to something that's fielding on an ongoing basis, and you can add a few questions now, and you can add a few questions, those same few questions six months from now and see yep. what's happened. It's very economical and you've got some data to talk about that might be helpful to the people that you are trying to serve around what customers are choosing or what they prefer in this sort of situation or how they feel about this particular situation. So there's lots of ways to start from spending no money to spending a little bit of money and then at some point, you may want to get something custom. Um, so you may want to hire somebody to help you do some focus group research or online focus groups, which I love. And they're just fascinating. And they're less expensive than trying to do it sort of in the physical world. Right. Um, or hire somebody to do some quantitative research for you, like we do with a survey and a report and all of that kind of stuff. But you don't have to you don't have to go from zero to 60 in 0.3 seconds. You can start, you know, warm up your chops about how you're going to deliver content around whatever you've got consistently and just start to build up and then someday get to the point where you can invest a substantial amount of money. Because again, for me, thought leadership, like everything we do as agency owners, has to deliver an, an ROI. It has to deliver a return. Same as our sales team has to deliver a return. Our advertising and marketing activities for the agency have to deliver a return. We're, we're, this is a for-profit business. Yeah. So, so you've, got to, you've got to have the elements in place to actually be generating a community that's following you starting to get people into an addressable list that follow you, have a nurture protocol that makes them want to reach out and work with you when the time is ready. So it's fine. You can go, you can go big if you want to. Um, and we certainly have seen that that can pay off, but it, it's not your only option. So sometimes starting small is just fine. And I'm always happy to talk with folks. I do a, I do a round table at the Build a Better Agency workshop every year where I'm talking about how to build uh, research into your thought leadership, no matter what your budget is. So um, going full bore with a custom quantitative study is not uh, necessarily the first, the right first step for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I was just thinking if you're doing like an e-learning platform, yeah, you know, you could start off with, I don't want to say a, a pre-quiz, yeah, but it, but you know people are primed to take a quiz at the beginning yeah. of an e-learning. You could ask certain questions that could be research based. Yeah, and based on that, you could be sending them additional material exactly. to make their e-learning experience better. Exactly. Yeah. Once you've got an addressable audience that you can reach, there's all sorts of resources and help that you can provide them. And if you're, you know, we are building assessments for clients to have on their website. Uh, if you're doing e-learning, I strongly recommend that you do a little quiz at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then you do a little quiz afterwards to assess the impact of what you've provided. And that not only gives you some data uh, about where people, you know, the challenges that people have coming into a situation like this, but you've also got the opportunity for some testimonial language, for some whatever, after people have completed that program. So lots of ways to collect data. And I really encourage my agencies to build 
their own community, their own panel that they can tap into and do a monthly or a quarterly survey of that group, asking them about something and treat them well and tell them what the results were and build that as an asset for your agency to use yes. on behalf of your clients and, and prospects. Yes. And that I mean, have to take a lot of money. It just has to take some, some intentionality. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, Predictive just sent out a survey. Yes. And because it's a community that I support, yeah. I answered the email within five minutes of getting yeah. it. Yeah. And, you know, I, back in the day, and you'll have to tell me this is still the same thing. If you got a 10 to 15% response rate for a survey, you were doing awesome. Yeah. If you got a 25% response rate, you should ask for a raise. Like, right. Right. You know, you know, and it depends. You have to, it, it, uh, people who are members of something are going to respond at a higher rate than people who've never heard of you. Yes. Um, but I think that it's, it's so funny because I would say probably 90% of the people I talk to come in with the assumption that nobody likes taking surveys. They're very worried about how are we going to get people to do this because nobody wants to take a survey. And ours are about 15 minutes long, the surveys that we're executing. Right. And the reality is most people do like to be asked and like to be heard and like to be able to share their opinion, especially if they know it's not going to come back and bite them in the butt. So having a third party who is executing your surveys for you so that so that your employees will give you real honest feedback um, about uh, how they feel about working for you because they are anonymous in the survey and their anonymi uh, anonymity is respected by and held by that third party uh, research firm. Um, <clears throat> there are ways to do it really well, but people like to be heard from and like to, and like to give their perspective on things. So yeah, if you absolutely. set it up, if you set it up right, you'll, you can get a very good response. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to ask about the role of AI yeah. in market research. Yeah. H how have you seen AI kind of either disrupt or impact market research and how people approach market research? Well, I think uh, there's there's kind of two fronts on that. One is developing research, developing questions in the right way. And AI, I think, can help you think about if you if you set it up right, can help you think about how to write a question that doesn't have your bias baked into it, um, and, and different ways to structure questions depending on how granular the kind of information you want to get is. So. Theoretically, you can have AI build a survey for you based on what you want to ask, right? right. Um, and then there's also sort of research that's done where AI is basically providing the response to the questions that you have. It is, you know, and, and we've had uh, technology for some time that can mine social posts and look for sentiment about something um, that you're asking about. And that's only becoming, I think, more pronounced uh, with, with AI. The trick with AI in terms of that is that it can only, it can only provide you information about stuff that's currently in the data set that it's working with. And yeah. um, a, a lot of times when we're talking about custom research, we're talking about building something with questions only you would ask. Questions that are different than how old are you and what is your zip code and what kind of a car do you drive? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the more niched you get and the more expert you get, the more likely it is that you'll look at custom research and go, that's that's what we're going to need because the stuff that's out there isn't talking about the stuff that we want to be able to talk about. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of people miss the opportunity when they're doing surveys to ask a question that actually sparks a thought yes. in your audience yes. so that they want to reach out and have a further conversation with you. But like, I've never thought of that. Yes. You know, what yeah. is my, my biggest obstacle that keeps me up at night? Yeah. We did, uh, <laughs> we did a, a thought leadership study for Craig Cody, who mm -hmm. is a CPA who works specifically with agencies. He's our CPA and he works a lot of, with a lot of the agencies that, that we know. He's just a great guy. And we asked questions about, you know, have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? Are you familiar with this? Are you familiar with that? 
And after the survey, he was getting people reached out to him going, okay, I need to hear more about this thing you asked about because I had no idea that was something that I could utilize as a business owner uh, with my agency taxes. I didn't even, yes. I'd never even heard of that. My CPA has never mentioned it. What is that? Yeah. Um, so you can, and you know, it's so important as a researcher, I really value the person on the other end who's taking the survey. Yes. And it, you know, the best surveys are, are interesting and fun for the respondent to take, you know, they're not boring. They're not asking about boring things that make you feel like a paper paper cutout. Remember those dolls that we used to have when we were girls that were made out of yep. cardboard and you could put paper clothes on them or whatever? Yep. Those yep. surveys just make you feel like it's all, you're just your demographics. They're yep. not asking really interesting, good questions. Um, there is a great book, I actually have it on my desk, for anybody out there who wants to start developing their old their own surveys. It's called People Aren't Robots. It's by an author named Ann, Annie Pettit, P-E-T-T-I-T. -T -T. Um, and she's just a brilliant researcher. And it's all about how to write questions that people want to answer, how to write questions that avoid your bias, mm -hmm. um, and, and how to make a survey interesting for the respondent to take. And I highly recommend it. It's just a thin little book. But if you're out there doing any kind of questioning of people, um, it's a great reference book to say, what's the right way for me to ask this question? And what can I do to make a survey um, valuable for the respondent to take? Yep. 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 That's awesome. It's important. We got to think yeah. about those folks. I mean, if yeah. you have an assessment on your site, you need to make sure that it's providing your feedback, your perspective, and your advice to the person who's taking it, you know, otherwise you're just sucking up their data and they're not getting anything for it. Right. Um, so you can actually build assessments that based on their score for a section provides feedback to them and gives them something of value. Even if they never hire you, they've yeah. gotten, they've gotten something that's very relevant to them uh, from your assessment. It's a great tool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Susan, how can people get a hold of you if they want to talk to you more about the subject or hire you and your agency to do some market research for them? Uh, the site is, is uh, audienceaudit.com. My email is susan at audienceaudit.com. And I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook uh, and love having conversations with people who are thinking about their thought leadership, whether our research is a part of it or not. Awesome. Thank you so much for all of your insight. And now I even have new ideas swirling around in my head, which is Yay! fantastic. Yay! It's always <laughs> good for having me on Lisa. It's uh, been a fun absolutely. conversation for sure. Absolutely. And thank all of you for watching. And remember, you can absolutely guess, but why not base your decisions on evidence? I'm Lisa Apolinsky from Three Dog Right, and we will see you the next time. Bye for now.